Thanks for joining us, everyone, and welcome to this presentation for the ARRL Learning Network, an initiative of ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. There are many ways radio amateurs can discover new ways to enjoy radio technology and communications. And this webinar series is our way to help connect experienced members with all of our members so we can share our knowledge. And thank you all for being here today. I'm Chris Bickle, K1BIC. I'm the Lifelong Learning Manager at ARRL. I'm a member of the Learning Network team and today's moderator. Today's presentation is a tour of the W1AW antenna farm and is being presented by W1AW station manager, Joe Karsha, NJ1Q. Today's presentation is being sponsored by ICOM. Thank you for your support. The session will be recorded and will be recorded on the Learning Network page approximately 24 hours after the session ends. And during the presentation, we encourage you to ask questions using the question box found along the right side. And we'll get to as many questions as we can during the Q&A period following the presentation. Before I turn this over to Jill, we have a quick poll question for everyone. Let me bring that up. And you should now see the questions on the screen. Select all that apply. It looks like everybody has voted, so we're going to close the poll. And looks like the vast majority of you are here to learn how the antennas are fed, about lightning protection, how it all works, and the relationship with the neighbors. So pretty similar responses here, so that's great. So now, Joe, it is all yours. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Karsha, NJ1Q, Station Manager at W1AW. In today's webinar, we're going to talk about the W1AW antenna farm. We're going to show you what we're using for antennas and towers for all of our scheduled transmissions, as well as all the antennas that are used for all visitor operations as well. And what will we learn today? Well, we're going to learn a little bit about all the antennas that are used here at W1AW. Now, this first shot gives you a pretty decent overview of the property. A little bit of history. We're sitting on about seven and a quarter acres. W1AW was first built here. Construction started late in 1936. And we actually started with operations in July of 1938. Pretty much there was nothing around us except that little brick building where you see the term Tower, South Tower. That road there was actually a dirt road. It was called Orchard Lane. It is now Star Avenue. We were very rural to the point where there wasn't even a water main going down Main Street. We actually had to have one installed when they built the building. So we've been here since 1938 and we will continue to be here as long as we can. Anyway, let's go over these intents. We have four towers. The South Satellite and North Towers are 60-foot self-supporting Rhone SSV. The Center Tower, which pretty much houses all the antennas used for all of our scheduled transmissions and two visitor antennas, is a Rhone 65, that is 120 feet. We're actually using the bottom section of the Rhone 65. This tower is normally about 250 feet tall and it is used for commercial broadcast, but we're using the bottom section. Now, while we can't really show you in detail, you may see these large black lines running down the tower. Those are actually the multiple hard line sections that we're using to feed all the different antennas. We use half inch Andrews hard line, running up and terminating into coaxial pigtails which then connect directly to the antennas. Now here we have a quick shot of the center tower. Now granted, it's not really located in the center of the footprint for W1AW, but for the purpose of this, we call it the center tower. And again, this, this tower houses pretty much all of the bulletin antennas. Now you'll see that we have multiple antennas for the same band, specifically 20 and 15 meters. We have two four element 15 meter Yagis and two five element 20 meter Yagis that we use for all of our scheduled transmissions. 
those are fed in parallel with each other, respective of band. Now, all the antennas that we use for all of our scheduled transmissions, regardless of band, are oriented to such to where we have pretty much a constant coverage of the United States. In the case of 20 meters, these two antennas are oriented such where we have coverage from, say, VE1 all the way down to the Panhandle of Florida. And by that, we're actually talking about the 3 dB power points. So if you were to look at our total pattern, we have close to 270 degrees of coverage. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't hear us in Europe. They actually can hear us in Europe. Part of that is because of long path and obviously other propagation methods. Now, this is the top of the 120-foot tower. What you're looking at right now is the rotatable 5-element 20-meter Yagi. And just above it, to just kind of can make it out, is the 2-element 40-meter Yagi. Again, used for all visitor operations. Now, the 4-element just below it is the 50-meter Yagi, and that is also used for the scheduled transmissions. That we consider the upper 15-meter. Now, in this shot in general, we are looking due west, roughly 270 degrees. So if you're looking at that 15, you'll see that it's pointed at about 290, maybe 300 degrees. The one below it is pointed almost 90 degrees out. And again, with the 3 dB points on the antennas and the coverage, we have relatively decent coverage on this band and 20 meters just the way the antennas are oriented. And here's a better shot of that 15 meter antenna. Now you will see it in the next slide, but those three little antennas you see just beneath the 15, you're probably thinking, gosh, those look like cell tower antennas. Well, technically they are. Those are five gigahertz sector antennas. And we're using ubiquity point-to-point -point transceivers on them, you can just kind of make them out, those have been modified for ARDEN, or Amateur Rate Emerging Digital Network use. Here's a little better shot of those three ARDENs. As the title says, they are oriented at 336, 80, and 190 degrees, respectively. And the reason for that is their locations, their, where they're beaming, are specific. The one oriented at 336 degrees is pointed towards the Talcott Mountain Science Center located in Avon, Connecticut. That's W1TMS, and we will be experimenting with some Arden use with them in the future. The one pointed at 80 degrees is an approximate shot right towards the capital city of Hartford. And the one at 190 degrees is oriented as such to where we can cover a portion of the area for the Newington Police Department. Again, all of that is part of this experimentation with Arden. These three antennas are located at 100 feet, and their height and orientation are specific. The Arden folk had actually given us the calculations for where they need to be oriented based upon the other sites that we need to talk with. Now going down the tower, you see that 40 element 2 meter that's the 5 element 20. There's that 15 meter, the sectors. And of course, that is the other 20 meter. There's the 40 meter. That is used for bulletins. The 10, the lower 15. And we're going to round out with the 5-element 20-meter Yagi. Now, this is our South Tower. The South Tower houses both antennas we use for all of our scheduled transmissions, as well as visitor antennas. Now, what you see here is the 3-element 17. This is oriented towards the west, and this is used for all of our scheduled transmissions on 17 meters. The two 6-meter loops, they are fed in phase. We actually have a phasing harness between them. 
and that is used for all of our scheduled transmissions on six meters. Here we see the top of the South Tower, and from top to bottom we have 12 meters, 15, and 30 meters. Now the 30 meter three-element Yagi is a pretty hefty antenna, and that gives us a pretty decent signal on 30 meters, considering it's a monoband antenna, and there's some appreciable gain on it. All these antennas are used strictly for visitor operations. And here we are looking up the South Tower. First antenna you see there is the lower 6 meter loop, followed pretty much by the upper 6 meter loop. There's the 17 meter 3 element. And now you see the big 30, the 15, and the 12. Just a little news about that rotator. You can just see it under the rotator plate and where the thrust bearing is located. We use all Orion rotators here. For our satellite work, which we'll be seeing in a few minutes, we're using Yesu G5500 series. And here we see our satellite tower. Now the four antennas you see there we use for all of our satellite activity, and generally that is for visitor operation. All these antennas are M-squared antennas, with the exception of the 2.0 gigahertz barbecue grill, that's an SSB Electronics. And again, we use that strictly for receive at 2.4 gigahertz. But you can just make out the 2 meter cross Yagi, then you have the grill, then you have the 23 centimeter Yagi that's not crossed, and then the 70 centimeter cross Yagi. Now just below it, you can just make out the Yaesu G5500 azimuth rotator. And I'm sure some of you are probably wondering about the stress that's on that rotator. And just know that that rotator will be located inside the tower with the mass going through a thrust bearing just to take the stress off it. Now just underneath that, you'll see that white crossed thingy there. It's used actually for the feed point for our 80 meter four wire dipole. And this antenna is used primarily for all of our scheduled transmissions, although if we wanted to put visitors on 80, we can use this as well. Now it looks a little complicated, but this is essentially just four 80 meter dipoles terminated both at the feed point and at both ends. While you can't really tell those white X's, it's made out of PVC with wooden dowels in it for stability, are actually three feet. So these dipole wires, these four wires on either side, are actually separated by three feet. Now we do that because this allows us bandwidth. When you consider that on 80 meters my CW frequency is 3581.5, and my phone frequency is 3990, your average dipole would not work unless I had some significant tuning involved. In this case, for our scheduled transmissions, I really do not like relying on tuners. Therefore, I needed an antenna that will give me wideband coverage. In the case of a four-wire cage, although it is quote-unquote old technology, it still functions quite well. Now this is slightly shorter than your generic 80 meter dipole because my radiator is now three feet wide. And the initial design of this antenna came out of a 1980 December issue of QST article. Now if you were to read that article, you could tell that the author had just kind of quickly thrown something up because they needed something for 80 meters, and that's all well and good. For our application here, I actually had to beef up the design simply because I didn't need to have this antenna fail on me whenever a small winter storm passed. Now we're going up the satellite tower. You can see a Comet antenna. We use that for D-Star. That little white pointy thing is a GPS antenna. We use that to feed a GPS receiver that we use to provide a 10 megahertz reference signal for all my test equipment here. This sidearm is used to house the K9AY terminator loop. Whenever we get on 160, we pull it up. You can just make out a 10 1990, that's a full of dipole, which will be replaced. A two meter Yagi, which we use for just generic work on two meters. 
the back side of the 80 meter cage, and of course you're looking at the underside of the satellite array. Now here we have our north tower. There's a lot of stuff going on in this tower here. We have our isopole, 2 meter isopole antennas that are used for our APRS and our wind link work. We have a couple of common antennas that are used for other D star frequencies. Now you can't quite make it out, but you see the little arrow pointing to the quadrifilier antenna, and that we use for our weather satellite reception. We like to receive NOAA, the NOAA Pictures APT satellites, NOAA 18 and 19 specifically, and we use that antennas with a receiver and now actually an SDR. This is our north tower, and you are looking at all the antennas that we use for all of our visitor operations. We start off with this big, massive 9 element. This is the 9 KHW from M squared, which we use for 6 meters. Under that, you can see the 70 centimeter. Then we have 10 meters, 2 meters, and 17 meters. We're going to run up the tower here. I could just make out a disc cone that we use for VHF reception. Just That's all we use it for. There's one of those isopoles. And you can kind of make out the Orion rotator just near the top of that. Those are all the different visitor antennas. Now, if you look near the top, you'll see something kind of sticking out on the side. That is the feed point to an 80-meter dipole. And that is used primarily for visitor operations. And that allows us coverage on 80 meters to the north and south. So between this antenna and the four-wire cage, on 80 meters, I have coverage of both north, south, and east and west. And as we all know, we're not supposed to read the little PowerPoint pages, but uh, I'll go through it anyway. As it says here, the majority of antennas were replaced with M squared antennas back in 2006. That was a major antenna renovation. The one prior to that actually occurred in 1989 when we actually went through a station renovation and that included replacing all the antennas. Now for 40 meters you're using the JK402T. Those are wonderful antennas. They are full band coverage on 40. And of course you have wire antennas on 160 and 80 meters. The cross yag is for 2 and 70. Collinears for the different bands for 2 and 1.25 meters. You couldn't really see those two collinears, but they were located near the top of the 120-foot tower. And those are primarily for all of our scheduled transmissions. Of course, the satellite rotators, the Model G5500 with automatic tracking. The Orion rotators, which are the 2800s. And, as I mentioned earlier, all Roan SSV 60-foot self-supporting towers, with the center tower being a Roan 65. Now, a little history about that Roan 65. That, that Roan 65 was put in here in the late 70s. In July of 1998, we had to replace the bottom section of that 120-foot tower. At the time, my antenna contractor had noticed that the three legs, which were welded into the pier base, were actually beginning to deteriorate. And therefore, the decision was made to rather wait for the tower to fail or fall down, we were going to err on the side of caution and just replace that bottom 10-foot section. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, there's a lot on that tower. How long would that have taken? Well, it actually took less than a day. Our antenna contractor had rented a crane. And after we had loosened the initial guy wires that were on it, they secured the tower near the top. They lifted the tower a whopping two feet. We loosened the cables. We pulled the old section out, put the new one in, bolted it back together, plumbed the tower, replaced the guys, and now we have a safe, clean new tower. Relatively new, I should say. And that concludes the tour of the W1AW Antenna Farm. We now welcome any questions. Okay, thanks, Joe. First question, how do you test your lightning arrestor gas discharge ceramic tubes? Well, we, we don't actually test them. Um, I will know if there is a failure, very matter of fact, because I just don't have any more access to that antenna. 
all the antennas are running into a large ground plane where these lightning arresters we are using polyphasers are attached. And when I have had failures, I would notice that I just no longer can access that antenna anymore. I have high SWR, no receive, and so on. So I normally do not test these polyphasers. How can you tell if a lightning arrestor has failed? Well, <laughs> I, I just answered the question kind of sort of. Uh, for that reason, the I will lose access. And it's because it's very matter of fact, if it, the failure, depending upon how it failed, was it because of just a static discharge? Do we take a direct hit or something like that? The polyphaser essentially is doing its job. It is affecting my ability to get a signal to that antenna or get a signal from that antenna. So either it's a high SWR condition or I'm just not hearing anything on the antenna anymore. Another question. A long time ago, I visited one W1AW and toured the facility. There was a basement area downstairs that was filled with QSO cards that the QSL Bureau was processing. Is that space still there and full of QSL cards? Wow. That actually was prior to 1989. Prior to 1989, the basement of W1AW was open for tours, and we had on display all the QSL cards that were received here, and obviously we would send cards back. Now, since the renovation, the uh, basement has been off limits because we do have a lot of the machinery down there. There's duct work down there. Uh, and so the only people that are actually allowed down there are certain ARL staff, including myself. But all those cards, everything down there has long since been removed. And again, that was done as part of the 1989 renovation. Next. Are the satellite antennas rotated AZ slash EL? Picture looked like they were fixed in EL. Yes, we have the Yesu G5500 elevation and azimuth rotators. Normally, all my antennas are parked towards the north when not in use. But we do control those antennas, both elevation and azimuth. For satellite operation, we use SATPC32, and we're using the GS232B for automatic tracking. What is the wind like at ARRL, and has, have we lost antennas due to the wind? Well, we can get to the old, we're here in New England, so we can have beautiful days, we can have microbursts, we can have windstorms that come through, straight line winds. Uh, we get the, the gambit here pretty much in terms of the type of winds. And knock on wood, everything has pretty much survived. Now, that being said, we have had some failures for some of the old antennas because of wind. Now, going back to 2006, the reason we had a massive antenna replacement was because some of the antennas, which were replaced in 1989, had begun to show signs of failures. And it was wind that actually broke off one of the elements of a 20-meter Yagi. And this thing came straight down like a spear, and my antenna contractor, who performs the inspections twice a year, had already told me that these antennas were starting to show signs of failure, so we have to consider replacing them. And when that element came down in 2006, that was the clear indication that, yes, these things have to be replaced. But it was wind damage that caused that element to break off. What types of feed lines to the towers are you using, Joe? For all the towers, we are using half-inch Andrews helical hardline. Now, the hardline will go straight up the tower and terminate at the point of the antenna. And there, from there, we have a coaxial pigtail. And as part of the 2006 antenna replacement, all the coaxial pigtails were replaced with LMR 400 Ultraflex. Now, that hardline will go down the tower and it goes into the antenna box. From the antenna box, we have the ground plane where all the polyphases are located. And from coming from that ground plane coming into the building, we have Andrew's half-inch hard line. And in some cases, LMR 600, but pretty much it's all Andrew's half-inch. Now, all the antenna lines coming into the building terminate on a very large ground plane with bulkhead connectors. 
And from that ground plane up into our patch panel, that's where we're using a combination of LMR400, Ultraflex, and RG213. Why are there no verticals on the HF bands? Well, we used to have a few verticals here. Um, and where we had them mounted, they were susceptible to, unfortunately, vandalism. But for us, we find just running the YAG antennas and rotatable works well for our application. Any vertical, I would prefer to have ground mounted. And the fact that this is kind of a public area and we do have people walking the grounds, it's a combination of both safety, but also the, the risk of vandalism. Uh, it's just one of those things that I just don't want to have to deal with. The fact that we did have a few vertical antennas here that were damaged, that pretty much answered the question as to why we would not normally have vertical antennas. And how were the beams installed in the towers? Do you use a crane? Nope. These antennas, are no, when they're hoisted up, they're normally uh, trammed up. My antenna contractor will locate the tram lines near the tops of the towers, or actually depending upon where the antenna is going to go, and secure it at the other end. And we will tram these antennas up, the, up and down the line, whether it be replacing them or bringing them down for repairs. I noticed that some of your beams actually straddle the tower it's mounted on. How does that affect your propagation pattern? All the antennas that are fixed are used for all of our scheduled transmissions. And there is no doubt that our antenna patterns are skewed. Because these antennas are located pretty close to each other and there is gonna be a little bit of interaction. Uh, whether or not the regular pattern of any of these, of any one of these antennas is horribly or significantly skewed is, is doubtful. Uh, I would gather, say that if you're looking at a generic pattern of this antenna, say in free space or half wavelength, depending upon band, that it would have a specific type of pattern, a pattern recommended or suggested by the manufacturer, that the pattern right now may not look exactly like what the manufacturer would say it is, uh, but there, we do know there is some interaction and in that our pattern has been skewed a little bit. But based upon signal reports to our transmissions, I don't think that skewing has adversely affected who's able to receive us. You have quite a few Yagis within very close proximity to each other. Have you experienced any coupling between them that negatively influences performance? We do have that, yes. And specifically, I see that when I am using a scheduled transmission antenna. I'm, I may use the word broadcast, and please know that's purely in the technical sense, but a scheduled transmission antenna used by a visitor. If I have a visitor on, say, my, my scheduled transmission 20-meter Yagis, and I put someone on, say, my 15-meter Yagis, simply because there's two of them, there's a stack, you're going to hear noise in each transceiver. The 15 is going to interfere with the 20, the 20 is going to interfere with the 15 a little bit. I try to get around that using high power bandpass filters, which are located in the racks, but also the low power bandpass filters that we have here in the operating studios between the transceivers and the amplifiers. But there is still some interaction. Our issue here is that we are in the middle of a residential area. And to have a wonderful antenna system and a beautiful antenna farm where I have towers that are wavelengths apart and I can put up stack over stack and, and not have any interaction between them, it would be nice, but that's just not possible located where we are. So we do the best we can with the antennas that we have. What technique was used to trim the 80 meter cage? Ah, that 80 meter cage. You know that took me a while to trim that thing. It uh, it was the the good old fashioned. Uh, you drop each set of legs, and you take a measurement, and you find out where you are in terms of your resonant point. You take a little bit off each leg at a time, and uniformly. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if I take two inches off one leg, I take it off all the other legs, temporarily secure it, and hoist the leg back up and take another measurement. 
Now our antimeter cage, it's truly resonant point is around 3627 kilohertz. I look at the overall SWR and actually, and I often joke about this, I will see how the amplifier likes the antenna. You can take measurements all day long, you can throw analyzers on it, you can do analysis with EasyNet Pro or anything else like that, but at the end of the day, how does your amplifier like that antenna? And I will adjust the antenna using an analyzer, carefully pruning each leg, and then I throw it on the amp. And if the amplifier doesn't balk, if it doesn't give me a lot of fallback, if the SWR overall is low across the band, in the case of 80 meters, then I know that the antenna is properly trimmed. When visitors operate on the HF bands, would that prohibit operation on HF stations when the HF code practice is being sent? Would that cause interference? Normally we have specific visitor operating times and those are from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. and then 1 p.m. to 3.45 Monday through Friday. So visitor operating times do not occur at the time of our normal scheduled transmissions. Now, normally Tuesday through Friday at 9 a.m. Eastern time, we have one hour of code practice with visitor operating following. And we have our regular schedule, which starts at actually 3.54 p.m. Eastern time and running to 12 a.m. So there would never be a time where we would be transmitting our schedule and having visitor operating at the same time. How do you keep from interference between antennas that are on the same band or harmonics? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we do use high power bandfast filters in the racks and those actually go after the amplifier. And within the studios, we have low power bandpass filters, which are between the exciters and the amplifiers. Prior to my using these filters, I actually had constructed stubs, which worked okay but the, the high and low power bandpass filters actually help with keeping down the interference. Now, that being said, it's not gonna do anything for actual harmonics. For example, if I just happen to have somebody operating at 7,100 kilohertz, you are definitely gonna hear their second harmonic at 14,200 kilohertz. It's just, the, between the antennas being so close and just the overall conditions here, there's no way to get rid of those harmonics in that nature. But with the filter we use, it, it does help. But there, you'll always hear a little bit of noise, but it's not enough to where it adversely affects operating. How many radios or amps are used for CW and digital practice, and how are they all driven? All total, we are on nine bands from 160 down through 10 meters. That's 160, 80, 40, 20, 17, 15, 10. We're also on six and two meters. And on the HF side, we're generally running anywhere from 800 to 1000 watts. So I do have amplifiers on all the HF equipment. On six meters, I am running about 600 watts into the loops. And on two meters, we're running about 150 watts into the collinear array. So every one of my transmitters that I use for all of our scheduled transmissions does have an amplifier. Now for the CW and digital, we are using the program FL Digi. FL Digi generates all of our CW code practice, bulletins, and qualifying runs. That heads over to a key matrix, which keys all the transmitters simultaneously. For the phone, we actually have a mixing board, which we, this is the phone bulletin that occurs at 9.45 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. That phone bulletin audio is taken and just fed directly into a distribution amplifier. And that amplifier, the distribution amplifier is connected to the audio inputs on all of the transceivers. What kind of modeling was done to set up the antenna heights? And did you use HFTA? Initially, when we had the station renovated, we had employed the services of a number of staff to actually model the antennas for us based upon the designs at the time. At the time we were using Cushcraft antennas. So they did model the antennas. They looked at the, the radiational patterns and what coverage we had. I cannot tell you what modeling software they had used at the time. Um, 
subsequently, when I would replace antennas, I would usually ask, say, Dean Strahr or someone like that, uh, or even uh, Joel Hallis, to model the antennas for us, again, based upon whatever model of antenna that I'm using. Okay, so now I can see me again. So you know what? I can actually like show you the other stuff just in case. Okay, so we're gonna go to the next question or? So we're just about ready to wrap up, Joe, and mm -hmm. wanted to give you a chance to explain. There are a couple of questions about you and, and how long you've been at AWRL and, and things like that. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background here? Okay, well, I've been at the ARL employed here since September, 1984 right out of college. I started as a grunt in the outgoing QSL service, then made it to VEC, worked in DXCC awards, came back into QSL as a manager, and then in 1996, October, actually September, I took over as manager here at W1AW. And when Dave Sumner, K1ZZ, had retired, he was the trustee of W1AW, he gave me trusteeship. So um, it's, I've been here for uh, quite a long time. Great, Joe. Thank you so much for your time today and showing us all the antennas at W1AW. And a reminder to everybody to visit our Learning Network webpage for a schedule of upcoming webinars and recordings of past presentations. You will get an email with a link to this recording, and you can also find it on our Learning Network page. And our next session is Ask the Lab, how AWRL's technical information service can help you. And it's presented by Ed Hare, W1 RFI. He's our AWRL lab manager. And that's on Tuesday, June 8th at one o'clock. And he can speak to how you can get help with antennas and, and ask questions. And we're always looking for more presenters. So if you have any interest, feel free to send us a proposal through our call for speakers form on our website. Joe, any final words today before we wrap up? I'd uh, just like to say that um... There was a question about when we're going to be opening back up for visitor operations. I truly can't wait for that to happen. I can't actually say when. All I can say is just keep an eye on our webpage and other social media venues. And as soon as we do open up for visitors, we will make that announcement for you. So again, thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the webinar. All right. Thank you again, Joe, for your time. And thanks everybody for joining us today and have a great day.